by the former Pennsylvania Governor Ed Rendell as one of Pennsylvania's best 50 women in business for her commitment to business growth, professional excellence, and community. She is also recognized by the HR Certification Institute as a senior professional in human resources. That's S P H R. That's the fancy letter at the end of her name. I'm a spur. <laughs> <laughs> a spur. Since opening her firm in 2005, she's become a regular speaker for the Harrisburg Regional Chamber and CREDC, the York County Chamber of Commerce, HR Professionals of Central PA, and York Society of Human Resource Management as well as other professional affiliations in the South Central Pennsylvania market. Karen lives in Harrisburg with her husband Barry and their retired Greg Hans. Mm -hmm. Tommy, welcome here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I don't think I need a mic. But holler if you can't hear me. Now let's see how my technology skills work. So, oh, look at that. It's like magic. All right. I promised a couple people that I'm probably going to um, scare you to death this morning, and I hope not. But um, in human resources, it is very true that what you don't know can hurt you. And um, I even have to practice what I preach because I have employees now, so I kind of have to pay attention to this stuff as well. And it's uh, funny, physicians are their own worst patients, and I'm probably my own worst client. But so. There were 99,947 employment lawsuits filed in 2011. 37% of those were retaliation claims, which is the fastest growing claim or charge out there. 35% of those still had to do with race in 2011. Uh, it, it boggles my mind. It takes approximately two years for a claim to get settled. Um, so my question is, who remembers what they had for lunch Wednesday of last week? Okay. Imagine trying to remember. Very good. We have one that remembers. Imagine trying to remember what happened in an employment relationship even six months ago, let alone two years ago. So in real estate, the word is location, location, location. Human resources, the word is documentation, 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 so that you can go back to your notes and say, oh yeah, that's what he said to her, who said that to him, and the roundabout goes on. So, 312 cases were resolved in 2011 for a whopping $91 million. And that's in lawsuits. That's in settlements. So that works out to, oops, see I'm not good. That works out to $292,000 on average. And I don't know about you guys, I don't have an extra $292,000 lying around in my business checking account or quite frankly, even in my personal account. Um, my building isn't worth $292,000. My home isn't worth $292,000. Um, so, if you do have that laying around, then you don't need to listen to me for the next hour. You're good. Um, actually, not 40 minutes. I'll try not to. I'll scare you for a little bit, but not bore you. Um, but if you don't have that kind of money, then even if you only have one employee, or even if you're thinking about bringing on one employee, if you're looking to hire a new executive officer, these are things that you need to know. You don't need to be experts in it. You need to be experts in your own particular field. But this is stuff that you have to be aware of. You have to at least know what you don't know so that you can keep that checkbook closed. So, you know, and this was literally just announced this week. I just got the press release on this Tuesday. A $1.3 million settlement in improperly classified, you guys should be familiar with this, employee versus independent contractor. This is the largest settlement to date in that particular area where the company had their employees improperly classified as independent contractors instead of direct employees. So they also failed to properly record and maintain time records. And who is the legislative body going to listen to? They're going to listen to the employee that walks in and says, 
Dick, here's all the hours I worked. And then they're going to come and say, Karen, um, what are your records going on? Okay. They were an independent contractor. I didn't keep track of their time. They billed me for it. They're going to go with the document that's been presented, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, but that's the document. Uh, I find it really interesting that the acting secretary of labor, Seth Harris, stated, misclassification of workers as independent contractors is a serious threat to their livelihood. I've also sat in a congressional hearing where the Fraternal Order of Police Association director argued that it was important that Act 47 not go through because not override union contracts because then the individual police officers would have to pay for their Uzis out of their own pocket. Yes, they said that in the legislative arguments in support of, um, I forget the act that overrides Act 47 when it comes to union contracts, but so they can say a lot of things. Um, I don't know that a, a simple misclassification goes so far as to be a threat to their livelihood, um, but it was a great press fight for the guy to come out with, with the settlement. So, who am I? Why are you listening to me? Just very quickly. Um, 27 plus years, okay, it's 28 plus years now in human resources. I started back in the dark ages when it was, when I was 20, I started <laughs> uh, Back in the dark ages when it was personnel and nobody knew what human resources was. And I decided it was probably mid-90s when it changed to human resources. Because I remember a title change. I went from assistant personnel manager to multi-facility human resource generalist. So that's when all of a sudden our human resources became our, our most important asset. Um, so, but I, I'm old. I've, I've seen a lot. Things still amaze me. Uh, but I have worked from setting departments up from scratch the whole way up to Fortune 200 organizations reporting into an executive vice president. Worked my way back down because I miss working with employees. But the organization's mission now is to provide realistic, affordable human resource management services and solutions on site, on call, and only as needed to help you eliminate the issues, challenges, and frustrations of being an employer. But the other important thing is I'm a small business and I'm a small employer as well, so I get it. I understand there are decisions that need to be made every day that have risk involved. And that's okay. You have to make those decisions. What's important, though, is that you know what the risk is so that you can make an informed decision. So how human resources and kind of being aware can help you keep that checkbook closed from having to write that $292,000 check. By the way, that's usually written to the employee that you fired because you didn't like them anyway or they were a waste of the paycheck that they were collecting at the time. Oh, and the $292,000 is generally tax-free to them because it really isn't wages. Um, but it's not a tax write-off for you, so it comes right off the bottom line. There's just so much good stuff about this settlement. Um, but anyway, what you need to know, and what you absolutely need to know, what you need to go back to your offices with tonight or tomorrow, so that you can be better prepared and better aware. Those are the things I want to hit on for you this morning. Um, it's not reality TV, but some of this stuff is, is real. And some of the stories that are shared have really happened. And I'm, you know what, 28 years and in business for eight years, and I, my mind still gets boggled by some things that come out of employees' mouths, and some things that come out of business owners' mouths. Um, but these are things that you can absolutely cannot afford to ignore. Um, as easy as it would be to just say, oh, you know, it's going to go away if I don't pay any attention to it. Um, but my goal also is to help you keep your money. Um, you usually don't have time for individual questions while I'm presenting because they're generally too specific also and may involve some personal and confidential stuff. I will stick around as long as you need me afterwards if you do have individual questions. Uh, you'll have access on my website to Just APA Builders Association spot as well if you need to reach out to me. So my question is, do you really want this guy knocking on your door tomorrow when you go back or any time in the near future? I will tell you, they don't usually carry nightsticks. They're not usually armed, but they will have a badge. Um, more importantly, they will have a really big citation book. So what you need to be aware of, 
are regulations by employee towns. Remember I said, even if you're only one employee, I'm up to four employees, so in the state of Pennsylvania, I fall under the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act. And I only have four employees, so I have to have non-discrimination policies in my company. But at one employee, if I have government, if I have a government contract, or I have a government um, organization, I have to have a drug-free workplace, which means I have to have policies in place for making sure my employees didn't do drugs before they came to work for me, making sure there's an education and awareness program in place for them. That's with just one employee. Equal Pay Act. Now, if you only have one employee, you're pretty much paying them equally. But as soon as you get a second employee, you need to make sure male, female, black, white, yellow, purple, they need to be paid the same, in essence, for the same type of work that they're doing. Um, ERISA is employment. Human resource people just love acronyms. We must have come out of the government in some way. Equal um, Employee Retirement Income Security Act is what ERISA stands for. Fair Credit Reporting Act, believe it or not, that crosses into employment and human resources. The minute you go to do a background check on an employee, the background check falls under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and you have to notify that candidate of their Fair Credit Reporting Act rights. In the event that something comes back negative and you choose to not move forward with hiring them, you need to send them the Adverse Fair Credit Reporting Act letter that says, here's the agency that told me this about you. It's between you and the agency to straighten it out, but here you go. Here's the report that I got. So it, this is just another one of those things that in human resources, you wouldn't think that it would even come to bear. Uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, that's the one in employment, you know, independent contractor, employee, the IRS gets involved in that. By the way, that $1.3 million settlement, that came down from the Fair Labor Standards Act. I promise you, the next people that will be knocking on their door are going to be the IRS because, oh, employment taxes on all those wages that you misclassified. You owe us. Oh, unemployment insurance that you didn't pay because now they're employees. Oh, and that's going back two years also. So they're all very closely related when they work together. National Labor Relations Act, a lot of us, we think of that in regards to unions, but that has to do with any employment relationship. Occupational Safety and Health Act. With one employee, when I had my first employee, I actually had to post the um, uniform services I really forget what USARA stands for, I'm sorry. Um, but it has to do with employment and return to employment rights of our military personnel. So if someone is called to active duty, I actually have to have a job for them when they return, even with only one employee. Now, that doesn't mean I can't replace that individual while they are deployed, but when they return, I have to have their job for them. We already talked about if you move into four employees. At 10 employees, there are certain OSHA record keeping responsibilities that you have every year. And if you do have 10 or more employees at this point, you should have your OSHA summary log posted right now. It's to be posted from February 1st through April 30th. Uh, 15 employees, AD, uh, used to be Americans with Disabilities Act, but now it's AD. Uh, Americans with Disabilities Act as amended, um, which pretty much just made everybody disabled. I have a whole slide on ADA. Uh, let's see here, we have Title VII of the Equal Employment Rights Act. That's the biggie. That's the race, color, religion, creed, national origin. Sexual orientation is not there yet. It is coming to the state of Pennsylvania. Familial relations does fall in Pennsylvania, even though it doesn't fall in Title VII. So I cannot discriminate against somebody because they have children and they're not married, or because they are married and don't have children. That's what the familial relationship is. Title VII also includes now Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA. So everybody looks at me and says, what in the world's GINA? I use myself as an example with that. Um, I'm a breast cancer survivor. Yay. 13 years now, yay, uh, but I went ahead and I had done what's called BRCA testing, which is, that is genetic testing. 
Um, I actually got it approved by the insurance company, surprise, surprise. Um, but anyway, they do testing to see if they do two different types of genetic testing to see if you have uh, the mutation for breast cancer and to see if you have a mutation for ovarian cancer. Fortunately, my testing came back fine. I don't have any genetic mutations, maybe a little psychological, but you know, what's life without a little bit of fun? Now, let's say that something had to come back and I was determined that I would most likely, no guarantee, but I would most likely develop ovarian cancer. Who in the world wants to insure me? Because I'll tell you what, that's going to cost the insurance company a lot of money when I get ovarian cancer. But remember, it's just, I might get it. But let's say an employer finds that out and they decide, boy, I really don't want that risk on my insurance plan. And then they don't hire me. That's genetic discrimination. I, I will tell you from my heart of hearts in 28 years of doing this and working for some pretty big companies, I've never quite gotten that personally involved in a candidate's background uh, where I've gotten genetic information, nor do I know that I, I think I'm wise enough to know that might develop and will develop are two different things. Um, so I've never been aware of anybody being genetically discriminated against, but apparently it happens because we have a law for it now. Uh, let's see here, at 20 employees, the American, your Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Um, is there anyone in the room under 40? I remember. Yay! <laughs> Fibber. Fibbing, fibbing, fibbing. Um, I remember, starting as a rookie in human resources, remembering 40. I understand why those people need protected. Well, I can't discriminate against them because they're over 40 because, by God, they're old. Oh, my gosh. Then I turned 40 and went, what the hell? <laughs> I still got lots. It's 30 years until I can retire yet. I'm not even halfway through my career. Over 80% of the workforce is actually over the age of 40 now. Uh, but there are still age discrimination and employment act claims coming out. And most are having to do with reductions in forces and um, separations. Because who's the easy one to pick? Oh, the one that's been with the company for 30 years and they're making a hundred grand where I could go out and I can hire a rookie a couple years out of college and pay him 30 grand. So it really has more to do probably with tenure and wages than it does with age. But if it gives the appearance that it's age, it would fall under the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. COBRA, how many people know what COBRA stands for? Right. Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. That's what COBRA stands for. What I don't have on here actually is when you, in Pennsylvania, if you have between 2 and 19 employees, you still have to offer a form of COBRA. So if you provided medical coverage and someone leaves or loses their coverage, you have to offer them the opportunity to continue their coverage. Um, at 15 employees, do we have anybody in here that has 50 or more employees, or any of our members have 50 or more employees? Okay. Uh, Karen, I'm just going to interrupt this second Absolutely. there. Just to let everyone know, as Karen said, this might not pertain to you, but it does pertain to, to your members. members. Mm -hmm. And it's a good resource to bring back to your members. And you. knowledge is very valuable. Mm -hmm. so, that Thank you. Subject for a GMS. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, okay. Um, so I won't spend much time on over 50, but just be aware for your members. Help them understand that if 50 employees, if they have government contracts in excess of $50,000, they may have to keep affirmative action plan statistics and reports, which has to do with how their population mirrors their community's population with regards to race and ethnic background. And also 50 employees, family medical leave. Now, of interest and of note to those with fewer than 50 employees, the courts really are looking at your leave of absence policies for medical and serious health conditions. And they are expecting employers to kind of mirror FMLA nowadays with providing 12 weeks of unpaid leave or some reasonable accommodation. At uh, 100 employees, there's WARN, which is basically an early, early warning notice if you have more than 100 employees and you are eliminating a third of the population through downsizing or restructuring. 
you need to provide a minimum of 60 days notice or 60 days pay in lieu of notice and an EEO1 report which gets submitted to the government. So, okay, so that's what you all need to know. Like, if, if a company said, oh, we need one employee and I don't want to hire you because you're black, that person has no rights. Yes. Wow. Under employment legislation. Now, in that particular situation, what would happen is they would probably have a, a private, a personal civil litigation right. suit but under no those circumstances. Federal. There is no federal or state yes. protection. So quite frankly, if up to three employees discriminate on one, mm -hmm. please don't say <laughs> And don't say that I said to do it. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> um, so, so, but uh, you're right. Okay. But generally, particularly as, as business owners, um, it's not good business to discriminate. Just because the government doesn't tell me I have to do it, it's not good business. Because I'll tell you what, stuff like that was spread like lines of wildfire. But there's two sides of every coin. So, you know, the example that you gave a little bit ago about the person that's been with the company for 30 years is making double the cost of what we can get a 20-year-old. Yeah. So in these times of, of tight budgets, mm -hmm. we need to lay people yeah. off at times. Absolutely. And who do you look at? The most right. expensive person. Well, we don't have to worry about them coming back to get us when we truly did it for budget reasons, yeah. but they're coming at us for age reasons or Absolutely. color or creed or whatever. Yeah. So there and really are two sides to these yeah. things. One thing I tell all my private clients, People could see at any time for any reason. It doesn't have to be well founded. And the important thing to keep in mind if you get a letter from the Pennsylvania Human Relations uh, Board, or you get a letter from the EEOC that says someone has brought a claim against you, that's their job. As soon as a claimant goes in and signs on the dotted line, it is the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission's responsibility, it is their job to investigate that claim, whether it's founded or not founded. They are just doing their job. It's our job to make sure we can quickly and easily defend that our decision was based on business reasons. That's why document, document, document is so important. So who's minding the store? Can I, I, I'm sorry, there's sure. one question. When you said employees, does that include, is it like heads, in other words, if I have or part-timers do I fall into that? Or yes. If it's, so it's, it's it bodies. Money, so. It's bodies. It's paychecks. Okay. Some of the regulations go on what's called FTEs or full-time equivalents. So you might have two part-timers that would equate to one full-time equivalent. Okay. But where you need to be careful is things like COBRA. That's looking at heads. It's not looking at people that are eligible for your benefits, so your part-timers might not be eligible for your benefits, only your full-timers, but they're looking at heads. If I have 20 heads or I'm giving out 20 paychecks, I fall under federal COBRA now. I might only have five people eligible for my medical plan, but because I have 20 heads, I have COBRA responsibilities. That's a great question, though. Um, Best rule of thumb for risk avoidance is go up to the next level to make sure that you're protecting yourself best. Okay. With the exception of things like family medical leave, you want to be careful with that. You don't want to get yourself committed into having to go by those very strict guidelines because under 50 employees, we do have some flexibility with our leave programs. 20 employees. A lot of when, when it comes to COBRA, carriers are very, very cautious about when they will allow you to let somebody be on full COBRA. Mini COBRA is nine months, full COBRA is 18 months. So the carriers are of particular interest in how you're administering your COBRA program. They should help you with that as well. Yep. Just for one point I had, I'm just saying, like, yeah. my association, okay. uh, myself. Okay. Full time and one part time. Okay. That makes the company have a five. Yes. Not yourself, right? Yes. If you are getting a paycheck. Now, I just changed to an S corporation in 2012. Prior to that, I was a sole proprietor and I was not getting a paycheck. I didn't count at that point. But now that I get a paycheck, I count in my head count. So that's what threw me from oh, oh, over the line. 
mean, which is good because I'm getting a paycheck now, but you know, darn it, I have to follow those pesky laws. So, who's minding the store? Very first one is the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Department of Labor or Labor and Industry, and in Pennsylvania it's Labor and Industry, federal government is Department of Labor, National Labor Relations Board, Immigration Control and Enforcement, OSHA, and Department of Transportation. I will tell you the evilest of all the regulators are Immigration and Control, which used to be um, INS, Immigration and Naturalization Services. ICE, if you hear that ICE is coming, first of all, they're the only agency that has to give you notice that they're coming. That's a good thing. They must give you 72 hours notice. But they will come, and they are brutal. They want to see every single one of your I-9 forms. Who all knows what an I-9 form is? Okay, about half the room. So if ICE calls and says, I'm coming in to examine your I-9 I forms. If you don't know what they are, chances are very good that they're not done properly anyway. The I-9 form has to do, that is the form where an individual identifies that they are eligible to work in the United States and that they are who they say they are. So they're proving identity and they're proving eligibility to work in the United States. It's been around since 1986. It really came to light after 9-11. Immigration, okay. Every error on that form is $400. Now, the form, there are three lists where someone can prove their eligibility and their identity. There's a list A, which proves eligibility and identity. There's a list B, which proves identity, and C, which proves eligibility. Let's say that you put your list B items under list C, and there are four line items. That's $1,600. They are evil. They're very serious when they come. And they, most regulatory agencies, if they come to inspect, they'll say, let me see a percentage of Give me your roster and I will tell you 10% of the population that I want to review their personnel files. Ice, I'd like to see your right. Congratulations on being assigned to sit right there because you're right in my line of sight. You're right in my line of sight. So, so Dottie, give me your I-9s. Okay? There you go. All right. You can correct them. They will not, they might sign you on the wrist and you might get a letter if you've had to correct your I-9s. I would encourage you to go back to your offices and look at your I-9s. Okay? You can correct them. No way out. Don't use way out ever. Cross a line through, initial, draw lines and initial. It's perfectly acceptable to self-audit and correct. And I would encourage you to do that. It will save you a lot of money and a lot of headache. Um, is that for any size? Any size. As soon as if you have one employee, you have to have an I-9. Did you have to have an I-9? You know, I know the act didn't come in until 2000. 1986. Yes. Now, if you have any employees that started with you before November of 1986, they do not need to do an I-9. I don't know if any of you but I don't know if that, it, it might, it still could. I don't know. Where, where's Rich? Perhaps he started before. He's not here. I can't even see him, and he's not here. <laughs> oh, fun. Um, Department of Transportation, believe it or not, this may apply to some of your members without them even realizing that they fall under the Department of Transportation. If they have a vehicle, let's say they've got a pickup truck, and they attach a, um, a trailer to it to haul a, a backhoe to a construction site. I will bet you at that point that the combined gross vehicle weight is over 10,001 pounds, which at that point means that it is a commercial motor vehicle, which means that that driver must have passed a Department of Transportation physical, carry a wallet card, they must have passed certain um, drug testing results prior to. 
So if the key is over 10,001 pounds, if it's over 26,000 pounds, they would have to have a CDL class A or class B. And a lot of times, I have a lot of private clients that I walk in and I know they're hauling stuff and I'll ask to see their driver qualification files and they'll go, what? What do, what do you mean Department of Transportation could come in and inspect? 10,001 pounds put somebody under a commercial motor vehicle. And 26,000 is a CDL, is a commercial driver license regulation. The one thing DOT is doing by us is they're setting roadblocks. Oh, yeah. Pulling them over and they're averaging from 10,000 to 15,000 and fines. Oh, they're smart. They, they will target. Actually, the, 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 our, our location is the same way with DOT. Um, what they've done is any, any pickup truck that's a three quarter ton or heavier, even if they're hauling lumber, can be scaled, weighted, and they can issue the fine at that time. So my recommendation is anybody that drives a truck for a company, mm -hmm. have them have the medical card on them. Yeah. It doesn't, it, it's, it's a minimal fee. And if they're healthy, year, you only right. have to do it every two years. Right. So. And that way at least you get rid of the medical card. The medical card fine is like $1,500. Oh, yeah. Straight out the gate. And that, that's the first thing they ask you for. If you don't have an updated medical card, it's $1,500. Yeah. So, all right. And that's actually a good seminar. We had some. Um, Excellent. From DOT come in. Oh, oh, very good. To do a seminar yeah. for our members to kind of go over the regulations and what they're looking yeah. for. Yeah. Uh, um, another organization that you may want to encourage your members to reach out to is Pennsylvania Motor Truck Association as well. Um, they're an excellent resource um, as well. So, uh, another company, or another, another organization, as soon as you have one employee's Occupational Safety and Health mm -hmm. Act. The general duty clause, and it makes sense. I'm going to trip over that chair in that carpet. Yeah, I, I wander. I wander when I talk. Um, general duty clause is basically you can read this and you can find it on the internet. But the real, the whole premise of it is we want our employees to go home in the same physical and mental condition. <laughs> <laughs> Let me finish. That they came to us in. All right. So if they came to us crazy, we want them to go home crazy. We don't want to make them crazier. Um, but we want them to go home with all their body parts and hands and toes attached and all of that. We don't, we want to cause them to get hurt. And that's our duty. And they're very serious when they say the general duty clause. It is an employer's duty to ensure a safe and healthy work environment. Um, you also have to maintain certain statistical records of accidents and injuries as soon as you have 10 or more employees. And you should maintain those for five years and including any accident report files. Now, of interest in 2011, there were 40,215 OSHA inspections. Um, remember I said ICE is the only one that has to announce that they're coming? OSHA just walks in and says, hi, Bob, I'm here to inspect your facility today. You go, great. You can't. That's your right. It's your right. It's your property. You are more than welcome to refuse them entrance. I promise you. Oh my gosh, thank you. I really need to step things up. No more questions until afterwards. Oh my gosh. I promise you, if you say no to an ocean inspector, they will be back before close of business that day with a warrant and five more officers. I I promise you that. It's certainly acceptable to say. Can we schedule a time for you to come tomorrow? I need to reach out to my executive officer, or I need to reach my board president and have them present as well. That is absolutely acceptable. They welcome that. They, in all honesty, they want to help you. They, it sounds weird. They really do. They really do. Okay. But the minute you say no to them, they're human, and you piss them off, and they're going to come back barrel waving. I've got 20 minutes, so I've got to really rock and roll. Um, workers' compensation insurance. You must provide the insurance. If you, even if you employ one person, you can, you can obtain it through the state. Really expensive. You can obtain it privately. You can self-insure. More expensive than the state. Um, claim reporting. Work with your insurance agent or your carrier or your TPA, but they generally have guidelines for the time that you must report. Employees actually have up to 180 days to report. We don't have that much time to report to the insurance carrier. Um, 
way you can minimize expenses, Pennsylvania allows us to post a panel of physicians. I would encourage you to take advantage of that. You don't need to work with a consultant to do that. Your insurance carrier will provide you with the panel. They want you to use the panel. Those are providers that they have negotiated with. Also, those providers will work with you. You want to develop a relationship with them. They will work with you to get your injured employee back to work sooner rather than later. You also want to have return to work programs. In the state of Pennsylvania, you have the opportunity for a 5% discount on insurance premiums if you have certain trained and active safety committees going. So this is all stuff that can help minimize your risk and save your money. National Labor Relations Act. Oh, they're just, you know, even though unions are going, okay, they're trying, they're not trying to go away, but they're kind of slowly diminishing. But the National Labor Relations Act, it guarantees the right of employees to organize and to bargain collectively. What does that have to do with my non-organized company? Well, the Supreme Court has even upheld the National Labor Relations Act of late when it comes to social media. Believe it or not, we as employers have absolutely no right to say anything to our employees about the nasty stuff that they say about us online. Supreme Court upheld, we had a company that actually terminated an employee because they said some really nasty stuff about their employer. Okay, we're all sitting around here saying that's really stupid. They're the ones that pay your paycheck. But uh, had some really nasty stuff to say about their employer and really really nasty stuff about a supervisor. Name names, called him names, so on and so forth. In and of itself, we as human beings and as leaders say, I don't want them working for me. I'm going to get them out of here. Problem was, individual had co-workers chime in to that Facebook chat. It was a public domain. But there were co-workers that jumped in, in support of the company and against the company. So it was a, it was a discussion going on about the merits of the individual's opinion, the company fired the one that started the whole thing. And he ended up being returned to work upheld by the Supreme Court, upheld by the Supreme Court because he was exercising his concerted right to discuss wages, terms, and conditions of employment. Now, had no other co-workers jumped into that foray online, chances are he would have still been unemployed. But because other employees of the organization jumped in, that made it protected under the National Labor Relations Act. Even though it was not a union employer, but employees are allowed to talk about wages, compensation, and terms and conditions of employment, even a public forum. How do we protect ourselves? We don't allow them to do it with our email addresses. I've had a private client who um, <clears throat> one of their employees was actually soliciting prostitution through Craigslist using their employee computer. Oh, uh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've seen lots of stuff, believe me. Um, and and the, the pornography on the, the computer was actually so bad I couldn't even share it with my staff. It was really that bad. And I, it was a telephone unemployment hearing. And I had to read to the person what I was looking at. And it was probably one of the most embarrassing times of my life. Uh, but anyway, he was soliciting prostitution on company equipment with company email. And we had solid policies in place saying, equipment is ours. We have the right to monitor it. It's our property. You don't have the right to use it for illegal, unlawful, immoral things. That's how we want. So he then filed a discrimination claim, going back to it. Anybody can, anybody can file a claim, they can sue us for anything, because he was a male and the, the female human resource director had been terminated because he was a male. Um, fortunately, when the EEOC investigated that and I sent them the disk of the, the, the like 37,000 megabytes or something of the pictures, we got the case dismissed letter, <laughs> but people, I mean, they, they can do it. So even if we're not a union organization, we still have to pay attention to the National Labor Relations Act. 
NLRA also protects employees. I know lots of handbooks say you may not discuss your salary with your co-workers. If you do so, you're going to get in trouble for doing that. That's against the law. You cannot have that in your handbook. They have every right. Okay, my common sense says I really don't want my co-worker to know what I'm making. Um, I kind of want to know what they're making because I'm nosy, but I don't want them to know what I'm making. I can't tell them that they can't discuss it. It's wages, terms, and conditions of employment, and it's the law. They are allowed to discuss it. Fair Labor Standards Act establishes <coughs> minimum wage, overtime pay, record keeping, and child labor standards. Child labor laws just changed um, this month, actually. There are some, it, mostly to do with the entertainment industry, but it affects every business that employs somebody under the age of 18. Um, I actually encourage most of my private clients to not <laughs> employ minors, uh, just because there are so many record keeping guidelines to go along with that. Um, and now they've become even more strict on your, on your employment posters in the minors section. If you have minors, you now have to update that schedule every week. Every week. You used to be able to put just a standard schedule up, not anymore. Uh, prevailing wage, how many people just love prevailing wage? Yay. <laughs> um, incentives and bonuses must be included in the overtime rate. That is something that they are really cracking down on, especially in Pennsylvania, uh, since they really started enforcing an independent contractor versus employee. They are also now taking a look at how you are including incentives when you're calculating your overtime rate. And you truly need to look at the employee's weekly pay to determine what their actual overtime rate is. Um, so it just an overtime rate must be at a left, eh, no, at least one and a half times their base hourly rate. Title seven of the Civil Rights Act. Um, Sexual harassment falls under this. Sexual harassment actually falls under the guidelines of uh, no discrimination based on gender. That's how it's why it falls under Title VII. Uh, probably the most interesting private case I ever had was male on male. Um, that was quite an interesting case, and it came down to a he said he said situation. Until at the end of the interview, the young man stood up and said, "You want to see it too?" Um, I just kind of stood up and said, you are so fired. Up until that point, it was a he said, he said, and there was not a thing in the world I could, could have done to him or that the company could have done to him until he just apparently had to shut off. So, you know, <laughs> human resources is so much fun. Now, you know, a, a lot of joshing and a lot of kidding as people were walking in. But one thing you really have to encourage, especially in your offices, you don't know who might overhear that and who might be offended. <coughs> Sexual harassment and other unlawful harassment really falls down to the impact, not the intent. I was only joking is not a defense, and it might have been the funniest joke in the world. But all you have to do is offend one individual with that. So, you just need to be very careful. I promised you we'd talk a little bit about Americans with Disabilities Act as amended. It's kind of always been in place in the state of Pennsylvania anyway, where you make accommodations for people. You do what you can to help anybody work. And it was the Vocational Rehabilitation Act of Pennsylvania, which was the forerunner to the Federal Americans with Disabilities Act. The change came about um, the as amended came about in really defining perceived disability. So if someone walks in on a set of crutches, they kind of hobble in to apply for a job, and Dick, you turn to Dottie and say, I wonder what their disability is. You have just made them protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act because you have perceived them to be disabled had a situation where we had an individual who, right before her very first day of work, it was like on Friday, her last free day before she had to come back to work, was in a horse riding accident and twisted her ankle. Well, God bless her, she came to work when she was scheduled to start her new job. Yay! But she came in on crutches. So the co-worker, 
she then, if she you know, had one or two, could have exercised her rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act for certain accommodations. She didn't, but she could have because we all of a sudden, because the co-workers were, yeah, as they will, made her fall under that Americans with Disabilities Act and be eligible for reasonable accommodations. Two important things to be aware of. If you have drug addicts or alcoholics, they are not automatically protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act, although they might try to tell you that they are particularly if they are practicing <coughs> users. They are protected, however, if they are in a treatment plan. If they are in an active treatment plan, they are protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act, and you have to be aware of certain accommodations that they might need. Generally, those accommodations would be attendant such things. Thank you. I'm going to go over. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the other thing to be aware of, and this is what scares people the most, that reasonable accommodation phrase. You know what? Your duty in Americans with Disabilities Act is to enter what's called the interactive dialogue. That's your job. All that means is you need to not okay, I'm going to pull over this side. Well, I understand that, you know, you're, you, you broke your arm, okay? And you might not be able to do all of the essential functions of your job right now. What do we need to do to help you be able to stay at work? I've just started the interactive dialogue with Walt by having a conversation. What do we need to do? Okay, how can we help? Reasonable accommodation might be every Wednesday off to go get chemo. Okay. That's good for the employee, it's good for the organization. Okay, I need six months off because I'm going to go have some exotic surgery. Well, you know, I don't know that six months off is really reasonable. It'll put a hardship on our company. All you have to do is have that dialogue. And that helps you cross from scary into protected. All right? Um, consolidated omnibus budget driving to Lacoa. We've talked about that. So I'm going to skip past. I'm going to skip past family and medical leave. Also, um, going to give you just a few more statistics about things that can happen without us even realizing it. AutoZone, and I'll, I have to refer exactly to my notes because I don't. I'll, I change the cases as often as I can. AutoZone, religious discrimination case. A Muslim was harassed by managers and customers. His supervisor was even allowing him to be called Bin Laden. He was terminated for complaining. He received a check for $75,000. You know what? Eh, I kind of get that one. Uh, Cadillac Jack was a retaliation case. Fired a female African American for complaining about race discrimination case. The forefront in the retaliation, the forefront in the retaliation claims, just to give you an idea of how easily it can happen, had an African American who was a forklift operator in a railway come forward and say, hey, my coworkers are really picking on me. They're saying that I got the forklift job, which is the same classification that these guys have. But it's a little bit easier because you're using machine to do the lifting. She came forward and said, they're really picking on me. Employer went to do the right thing. They said, let's investigate that. We want to look into this for you. Here's where they made the little boo-boo. They suspended her. So. They found out, yep, co-workers were saying that she got the job because she was an African American and because she was a woman, so she was, the co-workers were mistreating her. They brought her back to work, so they said, you know what, so that there's no more perceived favoritism, we're going to make you do the dirty job too, and we're going to put the white guy on the forklift. So, not only did they change her job, they suspended her without pay. So that is the retaliation case that went the whole way through the, to the Supreme Court. And it was determined that, you know, by taking those actions, they discouraged coworkers and others from coming forward with a valid concern. So, and I've got to tell you, is it, had I been the human resource director in that organization, I'm not quite sure how I would have acted because one of the questions you ask in a harassment case is, how do you feel about going back into the work environment? I'm not comfortable. I don't have any other job to give you right now. You're not comfortable going back. If I put you back, then 
on perpetuating the potential harassment. Probably the only thing I may have done differently was I would have sent her home, but I probably would have paid her instead of suspended without pay. I probably would have paid her wages, which would encourage my organization to do the investigation a little bit more quickly. Um, but that's how easily something like that can happen. You know, we caught Finley Honda, $150,000 settlement, and then the biggie, Pepsi, $3.13 million settlement having to do with background checks of African Americans. For some reason, one of their plants was only doing background checks on African Americans. All the other applicants were okay. They were clearly okay to hire. It only takes one person in your organization to put you at risk. So what do I do to prevent litigation? Litigation. Best thing for you to do is to actually audit your practices. You can self-audit. You can have a consultant come in. But what you want to do is you want to know what you don't know. And you want to know what you're doing all right, and you want to know what you're not doing all right, so that you can fix what you're not doing all right. So you want to take a look at the first contact with a potential employee, when they first walk in the door when I'm recruiting them, the whole way through to the end of the employment relationship, via resignation or termination. I want to look at that entire relationship. Soup to nuts, start to finish. Comprehensive review of your reality, and then analyze it by risk, and develop an easy to implement um, action plan. So some of the things you're going to take a look at with recruiting practices, job descriptions, classifications. Are they exempt? Are they not exempt? Are they truly an independent contractor? The IRS has a free 21-point test that you can use. You can do a search on irs.gov to find the 21-point test to determine if they are truly an independent contractor. Interviewing practices, preparation, training, and selection. Did you know that you should not ask what branch of the military you served in? Because the Army is easy for easier, allegedly easier for African Americans to get into, or less um, <coughs> affluent individuals. Marines is a little bit more of an elite. It's a little easier. You should not ask the question, so tell me about yourself. That's such an easy icebreaker, too. I will tell you, as a rookie interviewer, probably one of my first personnel assignments, I was doing an interview, and I started out with, you're supposed to break the ice. So tell me about yourself. Guy told me all about his experience as the Grand Wizard of our local Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> <laughs> now, fortunately, I was white. <laughs> so I was a woman, so that wasn't necessarily a good thing. I shouldn't have, probably should have been a wife, should have been in a kitchen somewhere. Um, and I'll tell you what. You know how they say, jury, strike that sentence? Mm -hmm. You can strike something like that from your mind. Fortunately, there were lots of other reasons that he wasn't qualified and wasn't a fit for the job. Because um, I'll tell you what, I'm sure going to find a reason. Uh, so ask, tell me about yourself professionally. He may have still given me the same answer, but it would have made it a little bit easier to separate. Um, New hire processes, state reporting. Every new hire has to be reported to the state. You can do it yourself. You can have your payroll company do it. Um, eligible, the I-9s. Pennsylvania Act 32. Oh, yippee. Pennsylvania now has its own local tax form, Paperwork Reduction Act. Yay. Orientations. And this is probably my favorite quote of all times from uh, a peer of mine, Rich Galbraith, uh, another spur. Your employees are getting an orientation whether you have a formal program or not. Unfortunately, it often isn't the one you want them to get. It's the water cooler one. Your handbooks. I'll tell you what, the number one problem in organizations where you run into problems is not doing what you say you're going to do or being inconsistent in how you apply it. Um, social media, you want to take a look at your separate policies that are outside of your handbook as well. Record keeping and posting, remember, document, 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 document. Do you have the correct documentation? What are your security procedures? Who has access to your personnel files? Which, what do you have in which personnel file? Yes, you should have at least three personnel files for every employee. Um, and personnel, personnel files and I-9s are probably the biggest thing that I see when I go out to the audits. 
Um, employment posters, are they in a conspicuous location? Employment posters have just changed again. Fortunately, the NLRA Act does not have to be posted. That's still, they're still arguing whether we have to post that or not. So don't post it yet. You don't have to. But Family Medical Leave Act poster just changed. So you need to be aware of that. Take a look at your job descriptions. Do you have your ADA requirements in? Or do you have a statement about physical and work <coughs> environment requirements that's necessary if you are going to enter that interactive dialogue? Um, are they consistent? What's your practice for updating job descriptions? Are your evaluations consistent, fair, and understood? Not only by the employee, but by the evaluator. Is everybody evaluating in the same way? Benefits. It, probably the third biggest problem is Section 125 plan document. Section 125 is of the IRS code. It's where we are allowed to withhold um, payroll deductions on a pre-tax basis for medical, dental, and you know, for health and welfare benefits. But you have to have a document that says, this is how we do it. So that's an area to make sure. Fiduciary responsibility, if you have a 401k or a pension plan, you have a duty to educate your employees. You have a duty to make your employees aware. You have a fiduciary duty to make sure your employees are aware that you have a plan. Uh, safety. What written programs do you have in place? There are certain required annual OSHA training, hazard communication. Even if you're just in office, if you have chemicals, if you buy your Windex in bulk, you have a hazardous chemical in your work environment. You have a responsibility to have a written hazard communication program and training and labeling. Um, workers' compensation management, how is it done? And required training. And I'm a fan of Donald, I'm sorry, it's a weakness, but I, it is okay to say you're fired, but remember, document, document, document. What's your process? Do you apply your process consistently? What's your practice? How do you communicate with the survivors? Something as simple as letting everybody know that, you know, Rich is no longer with the company. End of discussion, no more. They don't need to know the details. Then an action plan, usually your first item should be those that are regulatory and legal in nature. Next would be practice and consistencies. And then last would be more along the lines of best practices of what you want to implement. So that gives you an easy way. It's not so overwhelming. Okay, this is what I've not been doing right. This is what can really get me in trouble. This is what I need to straighten up within my organization. And then, you know what, a year from now, this is some stuff we'd like to implement so that we do it better and make our jobs easier. So do that so that you don't go back thinking, oh my God, we don't do anything right. Because chances are, you do a lot of stuff right. Find out what you don't do right and focus on that. So, how far over did I go? <laughs> but you started a little bit later. All right, all right. Um, as a special thank you, uh, my little, I leave Sunday on a cruise, so don't worry. We have <laughs> it is carnival. <laughs> it's car carnival glory. Um, we've decided they're probably the best cruise line to be on right now because they're going to be so hyper vigilant. But I will tell you, I'm going off the grid. I'm turning my phone off and my social media off, but I do promise you the minute anything goes wrong on that ship, I'm going to be the social media queen. <laughs> so keep an eye on at HR Resolutions on Twitter because Carnival will pay me to shut me up. Because <laughs> everyone will feel my